My name is Mark Kropansky. I'm a senior program officer here at Open Society Foundations. I work within our public health program uh, and within our international harm reduction team. Um, so in that work, uh, I have the good fortune of supporting um, really important work to advance the health and rights of people who use drugs and sex workers in places like Tijuana and elsewhere around the world. Um, thank you uh, for joining us for this book launch and discussion of Dan Werb's uh, new book, City of Omens, A Search for the Missing Women of the Borderlands. Um, before we get started, just a few logistic notes. Uh, we have bathrooms here on the side. I think everybody knows we have uh, some, some food, snacks, drinks outside as well. Um, and there are also copies of Dan's book for sale. Um, the books will be available until about 7.30. So if you want to grab a copy, uh, you might just want to step out um, if, if you want to do that before then. Um, also, just as a, a plug, if you're looking at the photos uh, and artwork that we have on display here, this is part of an ongoing series that OSF hosts called Moving Walls. Um, this is the 25th iteration of it, uh, which features eight projects by 13 visionary artists journalists and creative technologists dedicated to re-envisioning the topic of migration through documentary practice. Um, so for tonight, uh, how we're going to try to have things go, um, after my introductory notes, uh, we'll turn to Dan, who will read an excerpt uh, from his book. Uh, we'll then pause and have some open discussion, trying to keep things pretty informal uh, and dialogue-like. Um, and then we'll turn back to Dan for another excerpt reading, uh, more discussion, and so on, uh, hopefully doing two to three excerpts uh, through the night. Uh, and then we'll open it up to you all uh, for uh, questions uh, to any of us up here. Um, so in terms of introductions of our uh, guests and panelists, uh, Dan Werb is an addictions epidemiologist and the author of City of Omens, A Search for the Missing Women of the Borderlands. He's an assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego, and University of Toronto. He's also the director of the Center on Drug Policy Evaluation, which conducts high-impact research to support more effective drug policy. He's published dozens of studies on issues related to addictions, drug policy, and HIV, with a focus on identifying the impact of policy and public health interventions on marginalized drug-using populations. Uh, next to him, uh, Dr. Patty Gonzalez-Zuniga, uh, Dr. Patty is a Tijuana native activist and creative clinician with more than 20 years of experience working with underserved and marginalized populations in the US-Mexico border, uh, the border region, in the field of primary and HIV care. She's the founder and director of the Wound Clinic, Clinica de Aridas, an independent mobile clinic based in Tijuana, Mexico, focused on providing humanitarian medical assistance to underserved, underserved people irrespective of their status. Next to her uh, is Maya Solovitz, is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Unbroken Brain, A Revolutionary New Way of Understanding Addiction, which is widely recognized as an important advance in thinking about the nature of addiction. The book received the 2018 Media Award from the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the College on Problems of Drug Dependence. She has written for numerous publications from High Times and New York Times, including Time, Vice, Washington Post, and has several other books published as well and has won awards from Drug Policy Alliance, the American Psychology Association, American College of, and this is a long word, I never knew we had these long words in English, not just German, neuropsychopharmacology, um, <laughs> and others for her 30 years of groundbreaking writing on mind, substance, and culture. So welcome to you all, thanks for being here. Um, so just as a, a quick now intro for uh, Dan's book, um, it's already gotten a number of incredible reviews um, it has been chosen by New York Times Book Review as one of six true crime books to read this summer. Uh, <laughs> book list described it, so when you're on the beach, um, you might want to pull that out in Coney Island or, or wherever. Uh, book list described it as a powerful addition to investigative coverage of the volatile borderland, and Kierkegaard's reviews praised its steely focus in smooth, vivid prose. Um, I would just add but for myself, uh, having uh, been to Tijuana a few times and, and supporting work there, um, it's challenging for me to not get overwhelmed by trying to understand and let alone address the multitude of issues and factors 
that are impacting the health and rights of marginalized people there, especially women uh, who are injecting drugs or, or, and or sex workers. And Dan's book not only is able to distill these, but I think really synthesize it in a compelling way, um, while also grounding it in public health approaches and epidemiology. Um, and one thing I really like about it is that in doing so, I think a lot of times when you talk about these big issues, whether it's police violence or cartel corruption, uh, migration, the border wall, drug use, um, femicide, we often lose the stories of actual people, right? They, they become these big issues and big data sets, and we forget that we're talking about people with lived experience. And so Dan, you, he brings in a number of stories throughout the book that really grounds and anchors it, uh, that gives, I think, the heart and humanity uh, to what we're really trying to talk about and hopefully address. Uh, so thank you for that. And without any further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Dan. Sure. Can you guys all hear me? Cool. Thank you, Mark, for that uh, super kind introduction. And thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. So this book is about Tijuana, which feels like it's a million miles away from here. Um, but really, you know, as I worked in, in Tijuana and as I learned more about it and its history, it is a city that historically has been more, you, you could, I, I, would, I think you can argue, more American than Mexican in a lot of ways. This is a city that um, that uh, created uh, its success through catering to the vices and desires of American uh, of Americans, and in that way, I think it's it's almost like a quintessentially American city. And so, the way in which this city is treated um, through border policies, through the way in which um, you know people uh, living in the border regions are are considered and um, sort of interrogated by the American um, border apparatus, I think says a lot about um, you know, the broader uh, direction that uh, the United States is going. So this, this is a book about women living in the border, uh, in the border region, um, and the ways in which uh, their lives are affected by what happens on both sides of the border. So uh, I'm an, addic an addictions epidemiologist, as Mark uh, mentioned. That means that I essentially try to track epidemics at the population level. So try to understand the various factors that influence um, whether people end up succumbing to some kind of outcome or, or not. Um, and uh, this book, I, I'm also, I, I am a former uh, freelance journalist. So this book is sort of a marriage of those two worlds. So I'm going to, as Mark mentioned, I'm going to read just a few short uh, excerpts. This first one uh, describes my, uh, my first day meeting a woman named Susie, who uh, was a, uh, an outreach worker um, that Patty and I both wor uh, worked with, uh, who was whose job was essentially to go around Tijuana and try to recruit people um, who inject drugs, many of whom are women working in the sex trade, into an HIV research study. So I think that's about all you need to know for this. Susie's wrist is circled by a bracelet of fibrous scars running halfway to her elbow, raised and stiff. It is a legacy of a life in the Zona Norte, Tijuana's red light district, a cue to the many years she spent injecting drugs here. Scar tissue builds up around veins when puncture wounds get infected, a common problem among people injecting on the street, where dirty water is used to dissolve drugs and clean needles aren't available, uh, aren't available and get reused. With each repeated hit, the needle becomes blunter, making injecting an increasingly difficult and bloody prospect, especially if the needle has to be guided into veins that are collapsing from overuse. Zuzi had spent decades in this neighborhood, and its rough and informal energy was as much without as within her while the scars gave her away as a longtime resident. She was never a sex worker, but she managed to parlay her injecting experience into a bit part in the vernacular economy of the red light district. She was a hit doctor, someone highly skilled in injecting other people, and she did it for money and drugs. Mainstays of injecting scenes, hit doctors play an important role tending to the needs of those who cannot fix themselves. After years of injecting have caused the most accessible veins to collapse, and it is time to search your body for other closed paths, more intimate, strange, and arcane, like the groin, the space between the toes, the armpit, or the jugular, 
A hit doctor can help you with that. Or perhaps, like so many women, you were never taught how to inject yourself and are forced to rely on boyfriends or Johns to do it for you. A hit doctor can, can help you with that too. Susie helped all comers, but her clientele were mostly the Zona's sex workers. Eventually, we sat down in an open-air taco shop on a busy corner, and Susie talked at me in a barely comprehensible Tijuanaensis slang, with Patty translating on the fly. Susie, despite being at the epicenter of the HIV epidemic in Tijuana, only heard about the virus in the early 2000s, and even then, none of her friends would take her concerns seriously. A drug user embedded within a sex work scene, Susie dealt with what scientists like me would, de would detachedly describe as multiple risk factors epidemiologic shorthand for a life rich in complexity, one in which days are spent moving toward and turning away from the thing that you need, the thing that might kill you. Nobody gave syringes away, she said. I picked up syringes that had been thrown away, dirty. I washed them with water or I burnt them with a lighter to make a syringe out of other syringes that I picked up. I would make my own syringes because they didn't used to sell them, she explained. Well, they would sell them to us sometimes, but only in veterinary clinics, already used to inject chickens or little animals in the clinic. We would buy them for five pesos. Susie put her right arm on the table, her fingers running along the thick, discolored mass on her wrist. These are the scars that I have from all of the, from, these are scars that I have from all of the drugs I did, she said. Scars from the morbid instruments she was forced to assemble. Well, Many women got killed in those years, Susie said, referring to the late 1990s and early 2000s. La Paloma, La Paniqueada, La Osa, La Lobita, those were all my friends. They would pick them up, and many of them didn't come back. Who picked them up, I asked. Well, men picked them up for a job, and then they wouldn't come back. Susie groaned at the memories and then started to cry. Instinctively, I looked around. Nobody at the taco shop seemed to care about her sudden burst of emotion. I sat there on the high back chair and looked at Susie processing. So much had happened here in the small downtown core and in the small parcels of land near the border, near the canal, just a few blocks away, so close to the border wall that its shadow loomed over the low slung walls. I knew about the dynamics of HIV transmission, but what Susie was describing was another epidemic entirely the mass murder of women. Starting out light. Thanks, Dan. Um, so we've, I've tried to organize some questions that touch on a number of the big themes that emerge in your book, uh, but also want to leave it open, you know, for, for any uh, reflections or comments that, that any of you might want to make. Um, but Dan, I, you know, starting with you, um, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit uh, about your journey in writing this book. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know much of your work uh, previously, as, as I understand it, other than the journalism work, has been focused more on um, conducting epidemiological research uh, that might be for peer-reviewed academic journals or policy-oriented research. Um, you went uh, initially uh, to Tijuana not to take on this project yeah. and these issues. Um, how did this emerge? Sure. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, I went, I was recruited down to um, the University of California, San Diego, which is right next to Tijuana, right at the border. Um, and ostensibly, I was there to do research on uh, a Mexican drug policy reform. So Mexico, uh, in the mid-2000s, implemented, um, at the federal level, a massive decriminalization of all drugs. So on the books right now in Mexico they have one of the most progressive drug policies in the world. So if you're caught by police and you have under a certain quantity threshold of essentially any drug that we deem as illegal, uh, you are not subject to criminal sanctions, officially. The weird thing is that that drug policy, despite being written into law, never actually happened. So I was recruited down to, to see how the risk that people who inject drugs in uh, Tijuana, the, the risk that they would acquire HIV, to see how that would change after this drug policy reform uh, took place. The idea being that if you stop criminalizing people um, for injecting drugs, uh, they might actually be 
better able to access services and prevent themselves from acquiring or transmitting um, infectious disease through needle and uh, syringe sharing. But of course, as I mentioned, this drug policy never showed up. So I went down there and I was sort of, you know, just trying to engage as much as possible in Tijuana, in the subculture, and trying to understand um, the subculture of drug use, which was at that time largely happening within this uh, canal, the, the Tijuana River Canal, which basically cuts through or is divided um, by the border wall um, and spans both the U.S. and Mexico and where there were at that time, um, you know, around in the thousands of people who were living in encampments there uh, and injecting drugs, many of whom uh, were deportees from uh, the United States. And, you know, it was evident that what they were experiencing wasn't going to change with any kind of drug policy miracle. Um, and so I, I started to, you know, as I learned more about um, the particular perils of injecting drugs in Tijuana, what struck me was that there were disproportionately fewer women who were in these camps or visible in these sort of settings where people who were injecting drugs were either living or, or using. Um, and that struck me as quite odd. And as I learned from Patty, who uh, is in many ways the hero of this book, um, that women in Tijuana experience a whole other set of dangers um, that, um, than other people. So someone who is a woman who's injecting drugs, her life is going to be so much more dangerous and she's going to be so much more vulnerable compared to men who inject drugs. And in epidemiology, so, so you know, looking at HIV initially, um, what I was struck with was that you know, HIV seemed like, in, among women living in Tijuana, it wasn't even the, the most dangerous risk factor that um, women were facing. So as I learned, women were facing violence from police, violence from cartel members, being chased into the street by police um, uh, for whatever reason, and being hit by cars. And, and there were a number of different um, sort of what epidemiologists describe as competing hazards, right? So a competing hazard is when you're doing an epidemiologic um, investigation of one epidemic, like HIV, and other causes of death or harm start getting in the way of your analyses. And they start taking over um, your analyses and, and blunting the force of that initial epidemic. And as I looked deeper and deeper into the, the risk factors and, and the risks and the lives of women in Tijuana, it struck me that there were so many competing hazards. And while they all seemed to be coming from different directions, if you took a step back, it was almost like there was this meta epidemic, right? And all these other epidemics, HIV, overdose, um, murder, were all symptoms of a larger epidemic. Uh, and the, this book is really um, an attempt to understand that and sort of conceptualize that larger epidemic and also to understand what was driving it. And that's where I think, not to give too much away, but where reflecting back on border policy and, and how the border has changed um, sheds a lot of light on the, the true victims of of the way that um, we manage our borders and our relationships with our neighbors. Thank you. And Patty, you're, you're not only from Tijuana, been working there for over two decades uh, with people uh, who have been largely excluded uh, from the reaches of mainstream society or government services, um, but also you feature, you're featured prominently in this book. Uh, <laughs> as Dan said, you're, you're the hero of the book. Um, I'm just wondering if, if you can share a little bit about your work, how this began, um, and what you have seen there in Tijuana. Yeah, well, thank you for, for letting me be here. And um, my work uh, started, I'm a native physician, as uh, Mark said, and uh, I was working for a research uh, project, the uh, El Cuete project, and I'm still working. For, um, and that's like an observation research project. And I was watching like how people were 
struggling to survive every day by like, you know, paying, survive by paying for the room, by paying for a shower, by uh, paying the cops for not being taken to jail. Um, and also like the struggle that they were getting into access like emergency, uh, 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 emergency department hospital. We only have like one public hospital. And usually like when, when I asked people, like people were coming to the research or like we were doing outreach in the canal where that was where the people used to live. People will say like, no, I don't want to go to the hospital because they were killing, they, they're killing people, they're killing substance users. And I say like, you know, I in the previous, I mean before I used to, you know, be there at Tijuana General Hospital and I never like see that actually like a doctor killing somebody. <laughs> so I was like, how do you, I mean, how do you come up with that? And I say like, no, it's like people will go there and never come back. And um, some of the problems is like they're accessing like really late, I mean, in their condition and then they die and then relate that people will die in the hospital. Uh, other times uh, they will go and um, experiences from like people that are being there say like they take care of like everybody and at the end they will look at me and say no that's a drug addict. Uh, I mean that's, they, they let them be there so they can understand not to use drugs again. So there's a, uh, not a lot of compassion, uh, not a lot of um, very judgmental society, not only in the medical society, but also outside. Uh, so all the causes of uh, problems are caused by sub people who use substances. And I used to say like uh, Tijuana is also like a kind of like a, you know, busy, busy city and like people like to shop, like to shopping, shopping a lot. And I used to say like, are you being in jail for shopping like compulsive? <laughs> and so people are like, no, well, was, that's another, you know, that's another form of addiction, but that's not criminalized. And so been talking to people like uh, led me to go into the canal and start like uh, having like this clinic, which when I say clinic was just um, like me and other volunteers, some like epidemiologists and uh, uh, students and one of the students are here. <laughs> that used to uh, follow also and just, you know, start talking to people and the people will say like, I mean, there's, I never talk to, you know, they never listen to me other than to push me around or like the police to ask me what did I have in my pockets because a lot of the time like police will uh, do surveillance around uh, like the canal in uh, the Zona Norte, which is a red light district and um, if they look at a homeless, it's not like here. I walk around last night and I saw like people were sleeping and I feel oh, I hope like they can let them sleep over there on the streets. But now, I mean, there are like people like uh, police will go and, you know, take them to jail, uh, put them on abstinence for like 24 to 36 hours. And uh, you expect that because they're going to sleep in the jail, they're gonna come out a little bit like they can, they're gonna be able to eat or have like a chow or something. They like really come out worse because they lose their shoes, they lose everything that they have and then they need to come back and then in abstinence. So um, that's, that's how uh, my work starts on the streets and then they displace a large amount, a large number of people like from the canal back uh, a few years ago and then the clinic disappeared. So we needed to continue like a couple of months after that displacement to be looking for people like on the streets. And so a fundamental element that underpins this book um, is about drug use and addiction and drug policy. Uh, Maya, if I can ask you uh, a, a, a very small question. Um, what don't we understand about drug use and addiction? Um, you know, I think we're often told it's, it's a moral failing. Uh, people should just stop. We're told, you know, if you use certain drugs, you become addicted immediately. Uh, prohibition, you know, the, what Patty has just shared in terms of an approach in Tijuana is something I think we see in many places. What are we getting wrong? Everything. Um, <laughs> but um, 
it's just, it's so sad. What strikes me every time I go and, and talk to people with addiction is, is how much they have to give and um, what a waste we make by putting them through what we put them through. Um, it just it always breaks my heart, but uh, the definition of addiction is compulsive drug use or compulsive behavior that continues in the face of negative consequences. How do we try to fix it? By using negative consequences. This is really stupid. If we know that the one thing that doesn't work is punishment, why do we think more punishment is going to work? It's as though we're addicted to punishment, just like the people with addiction are addicted to the drugs, because we think that the drug will fix us, and after a while it doesn't work, and we just up the dose, right? Um, so what really is needed is compassion and to listen to what people who use drugs have gone through. I think if everybody just talked and heard from people, like I've often had the experience, and you know, I had my own addiction um, in my 20s, but I often had the experience of listening to people's stories, and they're so traumatic that like, I want to get high halfway through, because um, it, it's just unbearable. Um, you know, they're only five years old in the story, and I'm already like, Ugh. you know. Um, so we need to understand that people do drugs for reasons. And I loved what you said about shopping. Because we all have compulsive behavior that continues despite negative consequences. Um, we're destroying the planet, for one. But, um, you know, uh, there's lots of bits of capitalism that don't work if, uh, if we don't encourage that kind of behavior. Um, but we need to understand, too, that, like, despite this, most people don't get addicted even to drugs like heroin. And the people who do get addicted, it's maybe 10 to 20%. So what's different? There's histories of trauma, um, there's histories of mental illness, um, and there's what, what I kind of call outlying temperaments. Um, so if you're a kid who's different for whatever reason, um, you have difficulty connecting with people, and, and what we all need to do to be healthy and, and relieve stress is to connect with each other. So if, if you have difficulty connecting for any of those reasons, whether it be the stress of poverty or um, the stress of being mentally ill and not understanding what's going on with you. Um, when you experience drugs, you often experience relief from that. And, you know, one person might take something like heroin. And, and I talk to people who have experience with painkillers all the time, and they say, oh, yeah, like I, I took... Um, you know, I got OxyContin for a surgery or something like that, and it was like the best thing ever. And I knew I could never do it again, and I wasn't safe with it, and so I told the doctor, don't give me any more. Um, that is actually what typically happens if you have a life, if you have something else to live for, if you have kids or a dog or a cat or whatever, your music, whatever it is you care about. But if you don't have that and you get that euphoria and you get that sense of warmth and comfort and okayness, of course you're going to continue to do that. It's only human. And by dehumanizing people with addiction and by using the racism, basically, um, as a way of we use substances to control or to attempt to control or attempt to degrade um, you know, non-white people often. And the only way we're going to be able to solve our drug policy problem is to recognize that our, it's just based on racism. It's not based on, if, if we had drug policy that was about um, helping people avoid addiction, we wouldn't do any of the things that we're doing. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot of things I want to follow up on. Um, <laughs> but I think maybe if we can pause now again for another excerpt. And yes. We'll come back. Uh, yeah, and um, I think that's actually a great segue. So this next um, brief ex excerpt, uh, introduces um, Rosa, who is uh, one of the women that uh, I follow through the book um, and whose journey into sex work, into Tijuana. She is a migrant, um, sort of, uh, I think, exemplifies a lot of the things that both of you guys were talking about. <clears throat> the room in Tijuana was white, small, hot. 
The sounds of the street below drifted in through the window on an endless loop. Slow winding trumpets, an accordion vamping, the corrido blaring fuzzily from small tinny speakers, making it sound like a pile of dirt had been kicked over the band. Rosa, the woman I was interviewing, stared at me, flinty and impatient, with thick black eyeshadow and raven hair falling past her shoulders. She chewed on her fingernails while she talked, no matter the question, speaking in the same arrhythmic cadence, the words speeding and piling into each other like the beat up taxis outside, then suddenly slowing and trailing off into nothing. There was no excitement or pretense, just words and memories told one after the other. Rosa was 50 years old. She had about three clients a day. They usually paid her 100 pesos each, about $6.50. Well, Mia, Rosa said to my interpreter, there were so many clients I used to be able to choose between them. I robbed a lot too, wallets, money. There was no joy in her voice. In the 1980s, Rosa explained, she made a good income and avoided dangerous clients, easy enough when the supply of Johns flowing in from the United States was so plentiful. This was a time when money still flowed freely from north of the border into the city. And within the base economics of Tijuana's sexual market, Rosa was young enough to attract a lot of clients, but old enough to know how to satisfy mature men. The clubs on Calle Coahuila, the red light district's main drag, were booming. It was a time of excess. Well, you could find drugs anywhere and of better quality, she said. There were people everywhere, and you could see people pulling necklaces from women's necks, stealing and robbing in the middle of the day, a lot of violence everywhere. Thirty years later, I met Rosa in the field offices of Proyecto El Cuete. She was one of the hundreds of women participating in a study of drug-injecting populations in Tijuana. The longer Rosa talked, the more I noticed her jerky eye movements and anxious hand-wringing. There was a time limit to this interview. I wondered how long it would be before she needed to find her fix again. Before she came to Tijuana, Rosa was introduced into the sex trade in Guadalajara in Mexico's southwest. At that time, the city was being used as a laboratory to create Mexico's first modern cartel. Guadalajara in the 1970s was like today's Tijuana, a town exploding under the pressure of migrants from all over the Americas. As the Guadalajara cartel rose to power, it found its way to Rosa and other tapatias. Tapatia is an old word for female residents of Guadalajara, its etymology lost, though a 16th century Franciscan priest and grammarian named Alonso de Molina claimed that it was a bastardization of an indigenous Nahuatl word. For the Aztecs, Molina wrote, tapatia meant the price of something purchased. Well, I was like 14 years old, said Rosa, and a guy got me in. He started to dress me and all that. And then he took me into a casa de citas, which is a brothel. He told me that he needed help in the kitchen, she explained, but the casa de citas was next to the restaurant, so that's how I started to work there, when I started to sell myself. This is the story Rosa tells of her teenage years in Guadalajara's sex trade in the late 1970s. I asked her if she remembered the narcos. Yes, yes, she said, nodding to me. They came with rifles over there in Guadalajara. They would go and choose a girl, and they would take us whether we wanted or not. They didn't give a shit. It was there that she first learned about weakness and strength, about the cold brutality of negotiation. As a girl facing men with guns, the price of something purchased being worked out in the back rooms of the Casa de Citas. It was a lesson that she carried to her decades of work in Tijuana Zona Norte. In Guadalajara, they had guns and they did whatever they wanted with us, Rosa said. I told one of them that I had a sexually transmitted infection to try to avoid having sex with him, and he hit me so bad. So we had to have sex with them. This one time we went to a hotel and I was able to take a glass bottle and defend myself. He wanted to kill me, but, the, but at the end we were able to escape. The lawlessness that Rosa experienced firsthand was a symptom of a greater collapse of Mexico's social and economic order. So, as Rosa was told to put on a dress and walk to the very back of the restaurant, glimpsing the city's violence throb from within the Casa de Citas, she was standing at the precipice of an epic period of lawlessness. While she eventually found her way out of Guadalajara in the 1990s, ultimately ending up a migrant at the border, others didn't survive the city's cruel evolution into a cartel underworld. Between 1997 and 2015, 
1,344 women were murdered in Guadalajara and across the state of Jalisco. Those numbers swelled by Tapatia sex workers, their pain scoring the city and emanating across the rugged state. So, um, often I think when we discuss whether it's drug policy or the drug war or violence um, or even public health work, women are often ignored, um, although underpin so much of it, um, as you have just described in the excerpt here. Why is that happening? <laughs> um, and I'm curious, in, in a way, of, of the, the, the intersections that you found in the book, Dan, of not just women that are involved in sex work, but also injection drug use, and then even you know, linking it to the maquilladora industry yeah. um, that's driving internal migration within Mexico as well, um, and seeing a lot of these similar um, dynamics and risk, risk factors that are impacting all of them. Yeah, so, so Tijuana is this, as I described earlier, it's this city that has basically made its reputation and built itself up in a, in a really incredible way based on its capacity to anticipate and provide for the vices and needs of the United States. And it did so in a number of different ways. So it, it's a city that was founded in the late uh, 19th century. And originally, it had a monopoly on three... Uh, important economies, gambling, alcohol, and sex work. And none of these were economies that were available to uh, Americans, but uh, legally at least. Um, and so Tijuana became like this beacon where Americans could go to satisfy their vices, right? And sat satisfy the darker edges of the American consciousness and subconsciousness. And over time, what has happened is that first, when Prohibition ended, uh, Tijuana's uh, monopoly on alcohol evaporated. Then when gambling was allowed in the United States, in Las Vegas uh, originally, or initially, um, Tijuana's monopoly on gambling disappeared. And so that left Tijuana with one last vice economy, which was sex work. At the same time, uh, which it has really clung to and, and uh, which has made up so much of the reputation and, um, and been an economic driver of, of tourism uh, in the city for, for you know, half a decade, if not longer, or half a century, if not longer. At the same time, Tijuana became this, in, this manufacturing hub. So by some uh, estimates, over 90% of the pacemakers that are um, created uh, and uh, delivered to American patients are manufactured in Tijuana. Ditto for plasma TVs, which you can argue about the relative importance of those two products, but um, you know, ubiquitous across the United States, and all of it coming from Tijuana's special status. Uh, there's sort of all these interlocking free trade agreements that make it, you know, the fact that it's right at the border and it's got special access to the United States are really. Um, lucrative place to do business. So the maculadora industry has been this magnet for migrant women. Um, and it's a bit of a bait and switch in some ways because, uh, first of all, there's the, the maculadora industry in, in Tijuana um, uh, employs about 200,000 people. The majority of, women, of them are women. But this isn't really, um, you know, this is really intense factory work, but it's, it's quite precarious. So many women uh, aren't provided with actual contracts. Like they're sort of subcontracted so that they don't have to be provided with healthcare or any kind of benefits. Uh, if they try to unionize or, um, you know, protect or to um, um, advocate for their rights, they're simply fired and replaced with somebody else. And there are some real horrific accidents that happen because, you know, these are places that are creating everything from cars to computers to smartphones to you know, uh, mechanical equipment, medical equipment. So, so that part of Tijuana is booming. It brings migrants and often migrant women to the city. And at the same time, the sex trade has also been booming and sort of acts as a magnet for those women who are often unlucky enough to find 
uh, sustainable work elsewhere in, in more legal economies. And this is all explored in the book, but what I think, you know, the, what we've seen and what has been the true nightmare scenario is that while the economic integration of Tijuana and that region with the United States is just going off the charts, there has been an increasing effort to separate Americans from their neighbors. And in Tijuana, which is a city in which something like 10,000 women rely on the sex trade, that has spelled basically death. Because, you know, as Rosa described, back in the day she had clients, uh, and now, you know, she could choose between them. The, the whole area was bustling. And now she has to choose between three clients a day. And that's not just, you know, her special circumstance. That's, that was repeated by every single person that um, I talked to in Tijuana. And that is a product of ratcheting up of the militarization of the border and a desire based on, you know, um, perceived terror threats that can be um, addressed by increasing the militarization of your border with Mexico, which to me never makes any sense, um, or this notion that somehow we need strong borders to protect Americans from drug use, even though economists estimate that all the drugs that could provide the United States population um, annually could fit into 60 semi-trucks. And there are like millions and millions of trucks that pass through the border every year. So like the, the, man, like the magnitude is just totally out of whack. Nevertheless, the failures of, of, of these kinds of, um, this kind of militarization to address the problems that um, they mean to address, it, the border has been increasingly militarized. And that has created a massive level of separation between Americans and their neighbors. And in the case of women in Tijuana, that has hit them, you know, that has hit their livelihoods. Uh, and that has created really perilous uh, conditions for the women there. And the choices that they've had to make are a lot of what drives the narrative of this book to, you know, because basically when you've got nothing left, when the subsistence, subsistence that you've uh, relied on for your entire adult life is gone, what do you do? And I want to talk with you all about the border and, and the dynamics, but before doing so, um, Patty and Maya, I'm curious, I mean, it, it seems, and I hear a lot, that it, it seems to be a particular challenge for, for those of us that are working in the field of harm reduction or drug policy, public health, um, to really develop uh, work that's really tailored and, and, and impacting women uh, who are using drugs. And Patty, you've talked about your work in the canal and also seeing it very much dominated by men and the women kind of hidden in certain places. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you can just share a little bit about uh, what you have done and seen in Tijuana, your approach to that, um, and then following that as well uh, from you, Maya, in terms of particularly the experiences that women uh, who use drugs uh, are often treated. Uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere? Yes. Uh, well, I think for women it's like 10 times more difficult to survive. Uh, one is because it's like a generalized uh, machismo or patriarchal way that, you know, like the uh, men dominate women in Mexico. Uh, they're classist, and so they're like women that are, you know, either... They can be like business for beauty, <laughs> um, business for to be made. Uh, and now it's like mm, the women are used to like uh, sell drugs, like a small amount of drugs in, um, in the neighborhood. And I think, and also like workers, like for the maquiladoras. Um, and they're, the combination of all of these things made more difficult for women to survive. Uh, their height, um, they're <clears throat> separated from their children. Um, if they're like working in a brothel or working in a home, they cannot have their, their kids with them. And um, sometimes they let them at their homes by themselves and then the government will, you know, take them from there because they're not good mothers. 
So there's a lot of things that are making life really, really difficult. But I think uh, it's a patriarchal way also of looking and the government and institutions and businessmen uh, looking at women as like, you know, servants most of the time. And um, even like in the medical field, it's the same thing. I mean, if, if you don't dress like really well with high heels or makeup, you're not a good doctor. <laughs> uh, even like when I walk into the hospital, just visiting patients with my sandal, they, I mean, they kind of like dislike me for not being, you know, like looking like a Barbie. So I think it's like, I can look like a Barbie if I want it, but I really don't want to. Uh, I, I like to be me. And uh, I think some of these things are also like um, in, internalized into the people in general. So like uh, people try to make like a, a woman who use drugs the, the, the baddest of the bad person. Um, so I think we need to do a lot of work into that and also to make the programs and the, all the uh, strategies like uh, more into the feminine way to like m more onto the connection with uh, we have and we relate to others and not so cold as just as a, a strategy or like looking at the public health thing, but more humanized. I think, and from there, I think, um, you know, like the police is like, even like women police are like intimidating. It's like, you know, the sunglasses and like, they're kind of like, not like the, you know, the police here in New York that they're smiling all the time. No, they're no, they're never smile. <laughs> so I think those kind of things are making uh, people with fear uh, and if you, look like, I mean, like a homeless, like it's dirty. I mean, you're going to be mistreated all the time by everybody. Well, when you, when you place a, a group of people beyond the law, it reverts to physical strength. And women have a biological disadvantage um, there. And so, you know, it ends up being a disaster for, for women. Um, and so part of the reason that prohibition of both sex work um, and drug use um, ends up being so terrible for women is that it just puts them beyond the law. The other piece of this has to do with uh, women, you know, uh, people with addiction are seen as evil, selfish, bad people who they only care for their own pleasure. And women are not allowed to want pleasure anyway, right? So the kind of conflict between the stereotype of the addicted person and the stereotype of the woman um, really causes people, especially women, uh, a lot of problems. And so you're a bad mother, you're a bad person, you are just somebody who can be thrown away because you are not serving us and you are not putting everybody else first and you are not doing your role as a woman and as a mother and, and all of this kind of stuff. So all of that plays into the dehumanization and the horrible treatment that we see of women with addiction. And this is magnified the more patriarchal the situation is. Uh, and yeah, so it just ends up with women being at greater risk for every sort of thing, whether it be being killed or um, murdered or, uh, you know, getting diseases or, or any of, the, of this kind of stuff. And it's just, this is another reason why we need to do this differently. And unfortunately, um, the mass disappearance or, or murder of women, particularly indigenous women, um, is not something, uh, you, only happening or have happened in Tijuana, but also in the US, Canada, other parts of Mexico, um, and also linking uh, to drug policy and drug enforcement. Um, I'm wondering if, if, if you can speak to a little bit about this. I know Dan previously, you, well, and currently you're doing work in Canada. Um, Patty, you have connected with indigenous groups across the continent. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just really briefly say, so I'm Canadian and um, I started the work that I, like the research work that I do in, in Vancouver's downtown east side. Um, and, you know, so there's been this process in Canada um, where there has been an inquiry into the mass disappearance and murder of Indigenous women and girls. This has been a long, long process, years long, and part of a larger truth and reconciliation process similar to, sort of modeled on what happened in South Africa, to address the um, cultural genocide and um, mistreatment, structural systematic mistreatment of Indigenous peoples in Canada by successive governments. And in a weird sort of circum coincidence, the day that City of Omens was published is the same day that the inquiry uh, into the causes of um, the mass murder and disappearance of Indigenous women and girls in Canada released their final report. And while this book describes sort of what I uh, saw in Tijuana as kind of an epidemic of femicide, the inquiry described the disappearance of and murder of Indigenous women in Canada as a genocide. And the language around that, I think, is it, it, reading the report, it's, it's actually strikingly similar, right? It's these structural drivers, the, 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 the kind of slow and uh, unrelenting devaluing of the, val uh, of the worth of the lives of, of racialized women in both cases, um, amplified by addiction, by sex work, which um, you know, when women that engage in, in both those activities are increasingly vulnerable and, and, and their vulnerability increases. And, and so, you know, I, like, if you read this book, I think you, I imagine, I hope you come away with a sense of our shared responsibility for uh, what happens to racialized and marginalized women in the border. Um, but as a Canadian also, you know, reading the, this inquiry's report, like, this is a phenomenon that is repeated in so many different places, and Canada is often seen as this progressive beacon. And yet, you know, when that inquiry, when the inquiry report came out, there, there was, like, media plastering of, how could they call this genocide? Like, what is a genocide? This is totally inappropriate. Totally trying to undermine it and undermine um, the collective responsibility, essentially. Um, and, um, you know, it's very easy to feed into that reaction, but shirking the collective responsibility is exactly the driver of this kind of mass systemic structural uh, marginalization and, and death. I just wanted to add, like, this is intergenerational, and so when we punish the, the people with addiction who are already traumatized and already very separated and already you know, having a difficult time, their children are often being punished as well. And those children are going to either often grow up without parents or grow up with parents who are so harmed themselves that they are not able to care for them the way they should be able to do. And we need to recognize the inter intergenerational aspects of this trauma, particularly among indigenous and colonized people, um, so that people can recover and so that families can recover and so that we're not like just taking kids out of families and really doing genocide that way. Um, the, you know, this stuff hurt people hurt people. Um, allowing this, you know, creating the situation where we're going to, you know, victimize another generation, um, it, it's just obscene. And, you know, when you hear about the survival and the resilience of people with addiction and, and women with addiction and, and stuff like that, it's, it's really quite astonishing. And I want to say that, like, there is hope in this. People do recover. People do find strengths within all of this. Um, but um, we should stop um, oppressing them so that we can stop having these cycles. Yes, I think uh, what 
both of you talk is like the collective responsibility. Um, I think in, at least in Tijuana, the city, indifference is like bad, really, really bad. Because like people will do tours around the red light district and you can see like women standing there. Uh, like they, you can see them like 24 seven. And people, I mean, girls look like they're really, really young and everybody talks about like, oh, there's like so young, so young. And actually, I mean, they're young, <laughs> like kids, but the city doesn't, I mean, the we, I mean, just observing. And I think the indifference in the society, uh, I'm here far away from Tijuana, but I feel like we're watching something that is happening right now. And things happened before in the 1940s, and we're still talking about it. And now we're living into a society with oppressed, with discrimination, with separation of families, with exploitation of women and children. And I mean, we do, I mean, we do see that people die every day uh, because of many things, but people are sometimes not dying immediately, but they're suffering through their lives and we're observing and they're having kids. And as Maya was saying, um, like in Mexico, there were like a massacre, uh, like back in the 90s, 1990s, they killed like 45 women and their unborn children in Actial. And still there's books written about that, but they're still displacing people, indigenous people from the communities. Those people are gonna be ending in, out of their town, uh, out of the towns and they're gonna be subject to like trafficking and we're gonna be ending in working in brothels in Tijuana and all over. Um, and they force them out of the community, they breaking out. Um, also the militarization, the like current militarization of, the, of, of Mexico is like, it, it is gonna impact. Um, yesterday I was like, like having a lot of reflections here in New York and I saw like a lot of signs about like New York Police Department, like teachers and everything. And I, I was thinking like, I hope they don't make in that in Tijuana because like police is not good. I mean, over there, no, it's not good. So we don't want teachers from the police department over there. Uh, but I think there's how they want to turn in uh, here, I think there's a lot of programs that work and work well, but I think Mexico is copying a lot of the programs, but they're making a very bad copy of, mm. and so we're getting like really bad outcomes from that. So I hope um, things don't go in the direction that we all thinking is going to go. <laughs> and Oh, well, I just want to say, like, the, the other piece of this is, is just inequality, and it creates these cycles of fear and these um, kind of vicious cycles where people get more and more disconnected from each other, and then they get more indifferent, um, and then they just want to protect what they have, um, whether they're at the top or the bottom. And, you know, as the middle shrinks, it, it just gets worse for everybody. Um, so I, I feel like that has to be part of, of what we think of when we think about trying to fix this. Definitely. And on the issue of policing, I know we might have another excerpt r relating to yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, time. I'm, do we um, have time? I'm, yeah, I'm so we have worried. this space. Actually, I know, I think it was posted till 7.30, but till 8. So we have some more time if people here have time. Um, and I wanted, though, to come to the yeah. topic before that uh, on the police uh, around the border, um, because that was something that we said we'd come back to. Um, and one of, I think, one of the really striking passages, and it's something that is present throughout your book, Dan, um, you said that uh, the border is supposed to protect America, but has precisely been the driver, even the creator of Tijuana as we know it. 
Um, and you talk a lot, you know, and I think we've already spoken a bit about some of these factors around economic policies, around U.S. drug prohibition and, and exportation of the drug war, um, but also the fact of U.S. militarism and, and the growth, the, the, the location of the Navy and the Marines in San Diego and what that has done for Tijuana market. Um, also now, you know, in terms of the migrant situation, the use of this newly created uh, Mexican National Guard that is being used as a kind of auxiliary force of, of U.S. Border Patrol, if you will. Um, can you speak to this a little bit more as well in terms of how I, you, you've talked about how the border has uh, disproportionately impacted women and marginalized women, um, but how is yeah. you know th this dynamic where it's actually not um, keeping America safe uh, if you will, but it's actually yeah, creating a lot so, of problems. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's there's lots of ways in, in which that's the case. So, so just for some context, and also I would be remiss in my authorial responsibility if I did not remind you guys that you can buy books until 7.30. <laughs> a requirement. A sordid topic of coin. To quote um, a movie. You don't read. Yeah. <laughs> so fascinating. Um, so... We'll talk so for some context, um, the, the second largest naval base in continental United States is in San Diego, right at the border. And there's about 100,000 military and civilian personnel. And they have been the driver of Tijuana's sex trade for decades, more than any other group. So yes, you see the, the tours of Japanese tourists who have their own buses that go to specific brothels in, in Tijuana, those are kind of like oddities and interesting, but there is like a wholesale relationship between the U.S. Navy and the red light district in Tijuana. And this is not like an accident or kind of a one-off. This is what happens. This is the U.S.'s own research has demonstrated this, that when you deploy a force in a specific location, you will create a local sex trade. Like this is... This is the way it works. Uh, and in Tijuana, that's, exact, that's precisely what's happened. To the, and, and the level of integration is, is quite extreme, to the level that in the early 1990s, the U.S. Navy was, sell, was sending bulk shipments of condoms to the red light district and, not, uh, and also uh, testing sex workers in Tijuana for HIV. So this was like a really formalized relationship, right? It wasn't just kind of um, de facto. This was really formal in a lot of ways. And one of the major issues uh, that beset Tijuana and the women that um, are the subject of this book is that in 2009, as violence in Mexico began to flare because the state in collaboration with uh, the Bush administration, uh, launched the Merida Initiative, which was a binational Mexico-US plan, $2 billion to fight Mexican cartels through military force. This was launched in 2008, 2009, and it has led to a massive increase, massive spike in violence across all regions of Mexico. 100,000 deaths, about. At least, yeah. The, the government, in fact, at, at one point stopped publishing statistics on the number of people dying because the numbers were just too high. And it took Mexican papers to try to, um, based on their own reporting, record the actual number of deaths that were happening. So, so because of this violence, which was um, powered by American resources, Tijuana became too dangerous, ostensibly, for the U.S. Navy. And the U.S. Naval commander in San Diego forbade military and civilian personnel to go to Tijuana on shore leave. So this was like tens of thousands fewer people annually, customers of the red light district, who were you know, not going to be able to go to Tijuana anymore. And that circumstance, which, which in a way, like the violence, it, it's, it's, so, it's such a crazy feedback cycle or feedback loop where the violence is funded by the US, 
carried out by Mexico, that becomes ostensibly a reason to sever ties and also create greater militarization of the border. And that, in turn, further separates the, the two countries and the people of the two countries and the binational region, which really is in so many ways just like one region uh, that has been uh, scarred by this uh, border wall. And all of that continues to amplify the vulnerability and, the, and the, basically the level of distance between women who have, for their whole lives, been serving American servicemen and everyone else. Um, so it, it's, a, it's, it's a tragedy and, um, you know, I guess part of, like, the worst tragedies are the predictable ones. And if you look at the, 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 um, the research that the U.S. Navy did itself, the U.S. military um, sort of apparatus did itself, like the explosion of the red light district, the explosion of, of sex work, the, ex the potential explosion of HIV um, and an epidemic in this area were all predicted by the military themselves. Uh, and yet it was military solutions that ultimately um, caused the, the, uh, the vulnerability and, and epidemic of femicide that I talked about. And, and so in Tijuana now, Patty, there's, I don't, I, I don't even know the exact number of security forces <laughs> patrolling the streets. You have the Metropolitan Police, the Federal Police, there has been the Army previously, there's the National Guard now, there's private security personnel, there's the State Police as well. Um, how is this, um, and, and I guess we'll use this opportunity to talk about the police in terms of the interruption that they have done. I think often we're, you know, seen, and, and Dan, you talk about it in your book, that they were presented or should think of these kind of black and white pillars that the cartels and, and, and gangs are bad and the police are good, and it's much more complicated than that, uh, in Tijuana especially. Um, can you speak a, a little bit about this, uh, including around the new National Guard? Well, I think it's overwhelming. I, I remember the movie, The Gremlins. <laughs> and that's how I feel now, because it's like every place you turn, there's either a police car, a police station. Uh, they, I don't know why, but they're putting like a, a little like trailer or a police by like the park. Like any park in Tijuana, they have like a police station. Um, they have the commercial police who are like taking care of the business. Um, they have like the voluntary police that are like actually like paid police, securities. Um, so it is just overwhelming and the fear that uh, people try just to be home and like their homes are like cage. I mean, I say like we're getting into uh, uh, not going out because like there's so many if you go like into what used to be like the more like tourist uh, Avenida Revolucion I mean the red and the blue lights are all over but they're not only lights it's like the sirens are like constantly there plus the now they're calling like the fire truck and like <laughs> like when you called also like the paramedics now they're first is the police coming and they're asking you like okay so i need to check the patient i said like you're not checking <laughs> like we need somebody that really needs to deal with this person uh but it's like just overwhelming and now with the national guard it's like around the border um and then they, the ones that je, uh, dress like yellow now, like, I mean, the tourist police, uh, but they're like not really friendly <laughs> with Mexicans or with people that looks like Latino. I mean, they could be friendly to Americans, but not for, I mean, migrants or people that are. Well, and you, you've talked about, yes, last night you went and visited Times Square and you had this image that this is what Tijuana wants. Yes. And it's not. Uh, and it's not just your imagination, right? So broken windows style policing, this kind of aggressive zero tolerance enforcement of low level offenses, particularly targeting people experiencing homelessness, people mm -hmm. using drugs, has been exported by the U.S., uh, by our former mayor Giuliani here in New York, uh, to Mexico, including in Tijuana. 
Mm. Um, and so this is something I think, you know, you have talked about before. I'm wondering if you can share a little bit as well in terms of uh, what you have seen in terms of broken windows style policing and how this has impacted the health of people that you're working with. Yes, it's like, um, I think it's uh, like the broken window. Uh, they are, you know, here about that strategy and the term and everything, and they applying that as they understand, like business people, like they understand that. And even like they publicly saying like, you know, we're applying broken window because like people, ugly people makes the city really ugly and we need to make it, you know, we need to clean the city. We need to have uh, Tijuana Limpia. Um, and uh, they're going into neighborhoods and, you know, harass people like, uh, and actually applying that. Uh, I live really close to the border and like that happened to me. <laughs> I mean, they, they put syringes under a car that was parked. They broke the window out <laughs> actually. And even sometimes they send people around, they stole one of the clean, I mean, my first clinic band, they stole it after we did a demonstration, a commemoration of the displacement. So, I mean, I think that sometimes I think that I'm paranoid <laughs> of like things that happen, but yeah, they're like, uh, and then in the area that they trying to move people away from downtown because they wanted to make this place like pretty and good for tourists, um, there's over surveillance like the police is just really, really active and removing people from there. And people are leaving um, there. So the other day I was walking around, not, I don't walk that much, I should, uh, around my block. And actually I, I feel like I saw this uh, woman with her son playing like with a ball. Um, and there were migrants um, from Haiti. And uh, that was really good to see somebody like playing with a ball in the street. Mm -hmm. And I went, you know, I say hi, and the little, the little boy had a teacher saying like, we need to make hunger stop. Like, and he was like laughing a lot. So I went back home and I started drawing like a picture of them because that was like very, you know, uh, a, that was a happy moment for me in the neighborhood that I don't have anymore. That I go out every day, I see the police every day. I saw like by the border, by the, um, they, every place you see them. And so. And to add to that, um, there's this weird, you know, relationship, kind of multifaceted relationship between the police and the cartels that all sort of, um, gets stirred up with the sex trade because the sex trade is quasi-legal in um, Tijuana and there's lots of cartel involvement, ownership of brothels. Uh, and while Tijuana is the scene of one of the fiercest battles in all of Mexico between cartels, not only between cartels, but also between cartels and police, which has resulted in a, a murder rate of 125 per 100,000, with making it one of the most dangerous cities in the world. In the red light district, the police are hired by the brothels to protect them. And the brothels are owned in some measure by the cartels. So like there's this, this strange dichotomy where there's this fierce battle waging and yet there's collusion just down the street. You talk in your book about the example of uh, newly, soon to be police cadets entering an academy one day and then coming out that night with a badge yeah. and a gun. Yeah. Um, but that they had been placed there by cartels as well in terms yeah. of the infiltration of local police. Yeah. Um, my, I want to turn to you and open it as well. I mean, in coming back to what you had talked about early in terms of um, the racist underpinnings of the drug war and also the the emphasis that we've had on punishment and locking people up um, and I know that you uh, have done a lot of work especially around teen institutionalization um, and I'm wondering if you can speak about about this sure um, I mean we use the word drug and suddenly we can do anything to you mm -hmm. we have this idea that like once drugs are involved you are an animal 
and you are lower than a child and you have no control over yourself, therefore we can do whatever we want to you. And so we have, in this country, historically and up till the present day, um, if you say a teen is using drugs, you can send them to a place where they can be starved, they can be beaten, they can, um, corporal punishment in many states is legal in schools. So these are, these places say they're schools. You send your kid there. Um, you know, they can keep them up all night. They can shout at them. They can do all kinds of horrible, um, humiliating attacks. And what tends to happen, like tens of thousands of kids go through this actually every year. And what tends to happen is they, you know, they come out and they're super compliant for about six months. And then after that, they lose it. And a lot of the girls actually end up in the sex trade. A lot of the, um, people who didn't have addictions now do have addictions or the people who were smoking pot, now they're like using opioids and cocaine, methamphetamine. Um, So it's another example of of sort of the way what we do completely backfires and how, you know, this idea that if you use drugs, the only thing that can get through to you is like force and attacks, Mm. um, how that, you know, ends up traumatizing people and and making any drug problem they had worse. Uh, so, in in order to you know get beyond this, we really need to recognize that traumatizing. You know, we have as a society recognized that abusing little kids is not good for them. Well, let me tell you, abusing teenagers and abusing adults isn't good for them either. Um, mm. And so, even if you call them addicts. Um, it doesn't work. It, you know, people do not respond well to being told what to do and being told they are horrible scum. Um, it is not the way to build self-esteem or to uh, help people's mental health. Uh, a lot of what we're, the sort of bullying kinds of treatments that we have are basically about reinforcing hierarchy and telling people, putting people in their place. And that, um, in terms of the biology of stress, is incredibly harmful. Um, we know that uh, the more social stress you feel from being forced into hierarchies, um, the more you need social support and the less access you have to it. So um, it really um, you know, tears people up and, and is not helpful. Um, I think... <sighs> you know, this isn't actually a hard problem um, because, like, we kind of know what to do, but we've made it into a super hard problem because we don't do the obvious and because we've so obscured the idea. You know, I mean, it shouldn't take a study to show that, like, being kind to people is more effective than treating them like crap, right? But we have many, many, many studies in the addictions field that show this. And nonetheless, we continue doing what we're doing. Um, it's pretty obvious to most anybody who studied psychology that if you want to help people change behavior, um, telling them you must do this, this, and this usually prompts F you, right? (laughs) So since we know this about human nature and since people with addiction are human beings, we should be able to, um, you know, figure this out, but we've so sort of mystified it by creating the stereotype of addiction creating the stereotypes around race that we, um, you know, complicate something that, uh, that does not need to be this complicated. And, you know, yeah, it is hard for people to change addictive behavior, but it doesn't have to be the nightmare that we have. And, you know, one of the things um, I'm, I'm currently trying to write a history of harm reduction um, and harm reduction is the idea in drug policy that we should focus on reducing harm done to people not trying to stop euphoria, which when you think about it is a much more sensible goal. Why should we try to stop people having fun and enjoying themselves if they're not hurting (laughs) themselves or others? Only if there is harm should we be concerned. And suddenly, if you look at drugs from the perspective of harm, it's like, wait a minute, we're doing an enormous amount of harm trying to stop drugs rather than, why don't we just try to stop the harm? Why don't we focus on 
What are the dangers? What are the risks? How do we reduce them? And this is what we do, actually, when we see people with addiction as people we care about. Um, and this is where racism comes in again, because now that this opioid epidemic is, is white, um, we're suddenly like, let's do harm reduction. Let's do um, treatment, not punishment. Let's you know, um, uh, actually treat people OK. Now, at this point, that's still mostly in the realm of rhetoric. We keep saying we can't arrest our way out of this and then making new laws and new policies that ensure that we continue doing just that. Um, but if we actually believed what we say, that this is a medical problem, it would be being treated very differently. Thanks. And so I want to leave now time for questions and, uh, from audience members. Uh, but in, I think this sets up a good transition of the last question for me at this point, um, which is asking you for your, your thoughts in terms of prospects for change, uh, particularly in Tijuana. So the, the, like my thinking around this has just evolved so much. Um, you know, through the process of first getting there and having my preconce preconceived ideas about what is possible and then working through, um, you know, writing the book and understanding the, the circumstances of people and the kind of institutional morass that exists and um, how big the problem is. And while it might seem grandiose, my sense is that ultimately uh, the way in which the way in which we manifest our borders does more to influence the kinds of lives that people have in that region more than anything. And so, you know, and it's funny because I, 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 did, a, I did like a morning news TV hit in San Diego um, a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and it was like... I was describing the book, uh, and they were they were like, "So, what needs to change?" And I was like, "Well, there's this massive level of of economic integration and a complete social dislocation. So, I think that we need to, you know, radically alter the way that we consider what a border should do." And the anchor was like, "So, you're saying we should weaken the borders, right?" So, it, so that dichotomy. Is is so clearly defined in 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 people's minds, right? Like you're either for strengthening the border or for weakening it. When in point of fact, like it's kind of meaningless. Like you have two peoples or just one people living in a region that is going to be divided arbitrarily by a wall and the kind of the whole apparatus that and the infrastructure that goes around it. And that is just going to complicate people's lives, right? And it's going to complicate the way in which people interact and engage and cause people to take risks. And, um, you know, I think we're seeing that today with the way that people are approaching the border and then the way in which they're being dealt with when they are consumed by that apparatus. And, it, and it's truly uh, horrific. So, you know, I hope that the extremes of uh, horror that, um, current border policy and uh, uh, policies around migrants have unleashed can potentially be an inflection point to help us understand that, you know, like, if you want to humanize the relationships between two countries and, and two people in a region, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're weakening your society. Like, I would argue that you're strengthening it if you can foster stronger cohesion in those regions. So it's grandiose and but that's, that's what I think needs to happen. Well, I think um, I'm like impatient. <laughs> no, uh, I think like the way that, the only way I think is through relationship and like one of the um, meanings of the clinic is to get relationships from like people in the community from both sides of the border. And um, like we invite, you know, like mainly the volunteers are, uh, like I will say like 80% are from the US and only 20% are from Tijuana. 
And what I'm trying is to get like students and nurses and like in both sides of the border to actually come and work with the community and that way open their eyes uh, and get relationships with the community. Uh, integrating art into the clinic, we're, um, we're trying to get them also like for the users or the patients or the people that are coming to the clinic to take away that fear about going to the doctor or to the, because like in all levels, everybody's uh, afraid to go to the doctor or to the hospital. And so we're trying to change that and make like medicine more like healing. And uh, we integrate like, you know, like a drum circle in the clinic now where people are coming and actually they're saying like, can I actually, can I take, can I touch drum? And you know, in the last two clinics, people even from patients are like starting, oh, I remember that I used to dance, like the dance of the beer and actually they, they feel and they start the circle. And also like the doctors and the physicians are looking at like, Patty, what are you doing? And I say like, well, I just bring in the community together. Eventually, you know, like we as community can make Tijuana más humana instead of like relying on the police or relying on the institutions. So that's what I think. Yeah, and I, I, I have no idea how to solve the border. Um, <laughs> but I do know that if we want um, better drug policy, um, we need to start uh, with um, getting rid of our punitive and criminalizing approach. Um, and I, I really loved what you said about building relationships and, and just creating situations in which people feel safe. Because if you feel safe, then you're not threatened and you can um, be like, well, oh, open border, yikes, you know, instead of like, oh, wait, I can meet new people. There can be better ways of dealing with things. I can learn new things, you know, like, but if you're scared, you're just going to be like, ah, you know, and you're just not, um, the way our brains work is when we're scared, the cortex kind of shuts down and we are less able to think abstractly and less able to think creatively. And when you are calm, then, and calm comes from social connection usually, then you can um, be able to um, think of better solutions and, and, and relate in more kind ways and come up with ways that, that can solve these things that, that do seem you know, insoluble or, or so difficult. That's great, thank you all very much. Um, wanna hear from any of you. We have a microphone here, um, encourage you to come up. If you have a question, um, encourage you, if you do, to also try to keep it uh, brief and to a question. <laughs> we are recording this conversation, too, so any comments you make will be posted. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
there's lots of engagement with the drug trade. A lot of their power comes through drug trade and through the provision of services um, because of a void left by the government. That situation didn't arise out of nothing. Like that, that was the result of what was called the plaza system in Mexico that started basically when the institutional revolutionary parties uh, came to power in the 1920s and, um, um, and, and, and until they um, were uh, booted out of power like around 2000. And what the plaza system did was basically cede all responsibility and control of the drug trade to um, the cartels uh, in exchange for attacks and exchange for protection for government officials. Uh, and it was predicated on the notion that, you know, the government could control the actors who engaged and could, and could make sure that the field was clear for the cartels. And in return, the cartels did their business and nobody got hurt. That system is as close to kind of like a regulatory system for drugs and drug trafficking that Mexico has gotten to. And unfortunately, what's happened, as, and that was only really uh, possible when Mexico had sovereignty over its own economy. But as, you know, in the 1980s, the country defaulted and the IMF, the World Bank, the US, like all their creditors moved in and reshaped their economy and reshaped who the actors uh, were that were um, able to play the game. And that meant that the Mexican government could no longer guarantee the plaza system. This is a very long, and, and, and the result of it is the, is the violence that we see today as the relationship between the cartels and the government is totally frayed. I only point that out to demonstrate like how long it's taken to get us to this place where there's essentially a civil war raging in Mexico. Um, so the notion that it would be like quick and easy is definitely, you know, like that can't happen. But at the same time, I think that there are some prospects, particularly if you look at, um, creative and innovative ways to regulate the drug trade that you could potentially start by reducing the levels of violence and then move towards um, you know, a, regulata a, a regulated drug trade that would achieve a kind of peace in, in Mexico. Now the wild card of course is the US and, and um, the problem that the US has with that is that an agreement like that is a recognition of the insatiable demand for drugs in the US, which is not something that this current administration or really any administration has ever coped to. Um, so that set of kind of, so you'd either need like the violence to spill over into the United States and become so uncomfortable that that solution would be acceptable or a real understanding like in the way that Maya describes of the basic motivations for drug use and the types of drug policies that can most reduce harms, um, you know, have, have that bubble up to the highest levels of government. So, um, and, and yeah. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say um, this is why decriminalization um, alone um, can't solve problems like cartels and the trade. I mean, decriminalization would be very helpful for drug users and um, for their families and for all the people that are affected directly by addiction. But if you are talking about having a black market in one of the biggest products and, you know, I mean, if you think about it, America runs on addiction. We have you know, tobacco was one of our earliest crops. Then we had the rum and slave trade, right? Um, so, you know, alcohol, tobacco, sugar, we are running on the, and caffeine, we're running on, you know, these substances that we have accepted while trying to suppress these other substances. And it's not about which one's more dangerous. As we move into marijuana legalization, I feel like that, I mean, we couldn't imagine that in the 90s. I remember at the height of the drug war was when I started working in this area. And, you know, it was just like, you were insane. Like, you're sending the wrong message. You can't even talk about that. Like, that's like evil. Um, 
as we recognize that the world is not collapsing, Colorado is doing fine, Washington is doing fine, um, as we see that this doesn't necessarily result in disaster, we can then, I believe, move towards um, working out how to regulate some of these much more dangerous substances. And I think one of the things that we really haven't dealt with um, is what's going to happen with fentanyl in the long term. Because why would you grow poppies? Why would you deal with the complex supply chain that you need for something like cocaine or heroin when you can instead have a synthetic product grown by two people in the lab instead of a bunch of um, farmers and processors and smugglers and all this when you have a product that's like this big? Like the economics of it are going to drive us towards that. And you cannot solve that by interdiction. It's simply impossible unless you're going to have no international trade. Um, so we're going to have to move towards a way of figuring out how to regulate substances in the least harmful possible way. And this will have enormous, unpredictable, dislocating sort of effects on all kinds of things, like what are we going to do about unemployed poppy farmers or you know this kind of thing. Um, so I, I think it has to be well thought out. It has to deal with the individual substances, the individual cultures, the individual situations that are going to be very varied. But um, there is one clear thing, which is that this is not the way. I'll invite, um, I'll invite additional questions, um, please. And if you don't mind using the microphone or. Here, I'll bring one to you. Uh, whenever I tell anyone to go to Tijuana, any American to go to Tijuana, they say, you're insane. That's a dangerous, horrible place. When I tell New Yorkers to go to Tijuana, they're even more <laughs> reticent. When I tell New York doctors to come with me and go to a clinic in Tijuana, they're even more reticent. There's this vast view of Tijuana as like the epitome of all evil and danger. When really, like white Americans are probably there's no safer place on earth for you than Tijuana. You're protected by this gra the sphere of energy there. Uh, how do you guys think we can change America's present view of Tijuana, the city it helped create over the last century? And how will your book? Do you think on a more yeah. personal level? How do you think that will impact the Amer America's view of Tijuana? Yeah, it, it that, that's such a good point, and it's something that I grappled with because on the one hand, like I feel like bearing witness to the stories of women that are facing the kind of vulnerability and risk and and death that they are in Tijuana is super important. On the other hand imprinting a whole city with a kind of scarlet letter is is obviously the last thing that I want to do. Um, I and so I, I don't think there's an easy answer to that except that I hope that there are aspects of the book that um, if people read it they understand that you know the the joys and beauty of the city. Um, and also this sounds like um, I'm lying, but <laughs> at all the public events that I have done to date, like I have made a point to describe Tijuana as like a complex and challenging and exciting place. And you know, one of the one of the interesting side effects of the decline of American interest and in tourism in Tijuana, and you probably know this being down there a lot. Um, is this renaissance in Mexican-facing um, border culture uh, in all kinds of arts, right? Like so music, fashion, gastronomy, um, like even architecture, uh, visual art. Like it's, it's really, really exciting. Um, and um, Tijuana uh, uh, affords, I think, particularly like young artists, an amazing canvas to like do work in, and and that's super exciting. Um, yeah, but it's, I mean, it's not an easy, it's it's not an easy question. Like that, that is also the weird schizophrenia about Tijuana, which is that it's on paper, like I think, the most dangerous city in the world, 
because of the murder rate, and yet you can have like the greatest time there. And because, and precisely because the victims of uh, murder there and um, all the other kind of uh, after effects of the sex trade and the drug trade are so specific, right? Yeah. I think Tijuana is not dangerous to tourists and to people from outside. Uh, I think uh, I, I was born there and since I was in high school, I mean, you have the Scarlet Letter <laughs> all the time. We went to like uh, Monterrey to play like volleyball, like in a tournament, and they were saying, oh, those are the girls from Tijuana. So like saying like, you know, like girls from Tijuana doesn't behave good. Sometimes we don't, but it's our choice. Uh, and uh, but yeah, but that's um, I think I mean going from the outside to Tijuana is not really dangerous, and actually like uh, Mexico will protect uh, like tourists and Americans that are coming because are you know are the you know like the the way of they're gonna be making business they're gonna be having restaurants night restaurant they will protect you when you go to hotel they will protect you even in the most dangerous place in mexico they're i mean they're they're protecting so it's it isn't like changing like the image of tijuana because like it's two images i think two images uh and so one is like what uh dan was describing uh it's like a, a place where you can find fine restaurants, nice food, good um, to you know to shop for art. You know, it's good, but the, you have like the like the opposite. And I say like depending when you go, <laughs> like if you get yourself in trouble, then you will find it. <laughs> well, also, I mean. New York was written off as dead in the 80s, and we were supposed to be the most violent, horrible, terrible, bad place where, you know, um, nothing good could happen and, you know, cities were dead and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, we're doing okay now. Uh, nowhere near perfect, lots of inequality, blah, blah. But um, there is a vibrancy, I think, to um, places of extremes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So unless there's one more burning question, um, I'm just going to ask everybody uh, to join me in, in thanking Dan, Patty, and Maya. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, Dan, thank you very much for this book. Uh, it's powerful and very moving. And I hope folks got copies outside. Thanks. Thank you. He's thank you all Tijuana, for coming out. He's not from Tijuana, but he captured how Tijuana, the life in Tijuana is in, in this book. So. He's accepted. <laughs> <laughs>